Hello and welcome. Um, this is the first in a series of videos that are an introduction to NIST DTSA2. Um, NIST DTSA2 is software for uh, X-ray microanalysis, so I like to call it Power Tools for X-ray Microanalysis. Um, it is currently in the uh, Kelvin revision. I go A through so far, K, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, expect to release uh, a new edition about once a year and uh, update and bug fix more frequently than that. So, um, just as a, a, a matter of introduction, my name is uh, Nicholas Ritchie. I'm a, uh, uh, a researcher at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and uh, I've been developing. Uh, this DTSA2 for about uh, I don't know 12 years, maybe maybe a bit more than that now, and um, it's been very helpful to me um, to uh, make uh, some various ideas concrete, and it's been very helpful as a, a tool that I use uh, to teach other people about X-ray microanalysis. And part of that is just the uh, tool set that's available in here. And so I'm going to try and uh, give you a, a very quick overview of some of the tools that are available. So um, much as you might expect for a, uh, a, a tool for microanalysis, uh, this is energy dispersive x-ray microanalysis, um, you see a, a sort of spectrum window and then some spectrum tools and some, uh, some um, tabs down in here. Uh, to show you what these various different tools can do, I'm just going to go ahead and, and load a spectrum. So from the file menu, I select Open. And in this case, I'm going to load in a file that's in the uh, ISO standard uh, EMSA uh, format. Um, we can also load various different other types of, of spectra files in from various different vendors, including EDAX and Oxford and uh, um, uh, Tracor, and most of the major vendors uh, can be imported directly in here. Uh, or they can be exported in this text format called uh, the ISO EMSA format, in which case they can uh, be loaded in. So it can open most spectra. Uh, spectra uh, look like this, X-ray spectra look like this. There's a uh, series of uh, characteristic X-ray peaks, and then there is a, uh, a Bremsstrahlung continuum uh, contribution down here. So uh, one of the first things you probably would want to do anytime you look at a spectrum is to put uh, some uh, markers on these uh, characteristic X-ray lines. So I'm going to use this uh, tool down over here, the uh, KLM line uh, tool actually put markers on here. And so I'm going to just scroll through the lines. Um, usually I would uh, start from uh, high energy and try and uh, identify what the peaks are I see. So in this particular case I've put the markers up for iron in here and I can select the markers for those. So it places markers here and here, here and here. These are called the K lines and these are called the L lines. Um, I'm going to step down a little further and look at these lines here. Um, I can see that they don't really fit the titanium very well, so I, those would be the titanium Ks, or I can uh, look at the barium Ls, and I can put markers for the L lines and the M lines of barium. So if I see um, a particular evidence for a particular element in there, I'm going to put all the lines associated with that element in there. Um, I'm, I didn't check the K lines because they'd be somewhere way out here, probably uh, 40 or so KV. So uh, we're not going to see them in the spectrum. But for all the lines you can see in the spectrum, I put the marks down. Okay, moving it further down, I see we have these peaks here, calcium markers here, and I'm just going to step quickly through the rest of the lines here because I'm not really uh, teaching how to do qual right now so much as just showing what you can do. So put markers on here um, and um, 
I can specify to zoom in on a particular region. I can do these quick tools to zoom in on 0 to 5 kV, 10 kV, 15 kV, or 20. Uh, this particular spectrum was collected at 15 kV, and we can verify that because if we look at where the Bremsstrahlung or continuum goes to 0, we see that it goes to 0 very close to 15 kV. That means that the this is called the Duane Hunt limit, and it's consistent. So we have tools that we can use to, to, to visualize spectra. If we want to be more precise about zooming in, we can select a region, click and drag, and then it highlights that region in yellow. We get some information about the ranges and the number of counts, and I can click the Zoom to ROI button, and it will display that. I've been um, in the background using uh, my, uh, the wheel on my mouse to scroll in and out vertically. That's a very convenient way to zoom in and out. I can also click and drag over here, and I can uh, zoom in that way too. So that gives me a little bit more precise control. So if I click on the counts region, I get very precise control. I can also extract information about individual channels by double clicking and that tells me that this particular at uh, that ng i've got that number of counts in that particular spectrum so i can actually display multiple spectra so let's let's go ahead and do that and i'll look at the calcium standard too and we can see now that if i double click it'll tell me the number of counts in both of these spectra okay so now that we have two spectra up here, uh, I double click to get rid of the cursor. Um, now um, we can see how these uh, two spectra compare. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit and look and see we have the uh, uh, a calcium fluoride and then this K309, which is a glass containing multiple elements. And you can see that uh, the uh, K line in the calcium fluoride is much more intense than the K line in the uh, glass uh, because I'm displaying these on the same scale. Well, that's one way that you might want to display spectra. Another way is you can uh, scale to the highest peak. That shows you that, and it reports it over here. Looks like that. Now, the most intense peak in every spectrum is, is scaled to the same height. Then I can uh, scale to the same probe dose. That's a, uh, uh, a way to compare spectra that were collected at different live times or different probe currents. I can scale to an equal integral so that the number of uh, counts is normalized so that they're both similar in that regard. Or I can scale to um, uh, a region integral. So in that case, I might select a particular peak, for example, and then I might say spectrum comparison scale to region integral. Now, uh, I haven't hadn't mentioned it, but uh, I probably ought to. And how do, the, uh, how do you actually get to these menus? Well, uh, you uh, would use the uh, right mouse button, so you click the right mouse button, and that brings up a menu like this, which has various pieces of context-sensitive menu items. So these are things that you would want to do to your spectrum, and we'll go through most of them. But um, you can also, uh, it, it, the menu that shows up varies. If you click in a region that is highlighted, you get a slightly different set of, of menu items based on things, tools that you would want for that highlighted region. Okay, so I'm just going to clear that region and then I am going to uh, go back to the scale. I usually use the same scale, so spec, uh, present the spectra um, on a scale, absolute scale of intensity. So by number of counts in the channel. So um, there are these tools for visualizing. Um, there are also tools for doing uh, things like peak integration. So um, 
sometimes you want to just know how many counts are in a particular peak so I can swipe out a region encompassing the peak and then I can use the uh, uh, peak tools to integrate the peak background corrected I can integrate the peak so this would be um, the background being this these channels in here. If we were to continue the continuum, the Bremsstrahlung through here and correct for that, we would get the background peak corrected peak intensity, essentially all the peak that is above this level here. So I could go background corrected peak intensity and it gives me a table of numbers. So these table, this table of numbers you might want to extract, so you copy the status text and then you can paste that status text into a uh, spreadsheet or something like that. So there are peak integration tools, and there are various different types of peak integration tools. So I can do a, that was a uh, swiping of one region, and then do a background corrected peak integral. I could select three regions, and I can use those to do a, a three ROI integration, in which case it uses this background level defined by these ranger channels, this background level defined by this range of in channels and interpolates between them to estimate the background and then subtracts that off from the integral of this range of channels. So that would be integrate peak 3 ROI integration. And as we can see that uh, for the calcium fluoride where there is no nominally no peak in there that this number is very small 89 plus or minus 169 which is uh, essentially zero which is as it ought to be. Um, so there are those tools for doing those sorts of peak integrations. Um, there are also uh, various different options we have as to the displays of the KLM lines. So we've, uh, looking at these lines, we can label the KLM lines by an element. This would be the full element name. We can uh, label them with the element abbreviation, which is what we did before. Large abbreviation, this is sometimes useful if you want to output the, the uh, spectrum as displayed uh, for a paper or a report. Uh, KLM labels. Uh, Sigbon, so these are Sigbon notations, so this says that this, this peak here is actually the iron K alpha plus two additional lines. Um, Actually, if we zoom in here, we can see those lines. So it, uh, what are those lines? Where are the, there are this, these two here. Okay. Um, when we zoom out, it actually is smart enough to know to combine them into uh, uh, one line where there were two, so as not to have too much clutter of lines here. Okay, another option. Seek bond lines. IUPAC, IUPAC is the preferred notation for uh, uh, characteristic X-ray lines. The modern notation, uh, albeit not uh, widely used, uh, but it's far less ambiguous and far more precise way of labeling peaks. So it's it's generally preferred. Uh, you can also label them with the family. So this is to say this is uh, uh, iron K alpha, this is the iron K beta, and uh, like this. Um, so you have a lot of different options as to how you label your uh, spectra. I usually just leave the element abbreviation, and uh, um, that uh, gives us something that looks like that. So, um, okay, so you, ha you have the spectrum here and you want to um, uh, put it into a report. How would you go about doing that? Well, I might scale it up, get, uh, so I can see what I want to see, and then I would uh, copy this as a bitmap. So, Copying it as a bitmap actually produces a very, very high quality representation of what you see here. Um, the scaling is a little counterintuitive in the sense that um, uh, the, the size of the lettering depends upon the size of the display on the screen. So uh, 
Usually what I do is I pick a consistent size displayed up here in this left hand corner. So that's to say that this width here from that to that is 1235 pixels and the height is 12, uh, 295 pixels. So that every uh, spectrum shows up with the same scale in the report. I actually usually pick uh, 800 by 250. So I would do that by, by actually just dragging the window and resizing the window to get 800 by 250. And I find that uh, produces a spectrum in which the labels for the lines and the labels for this energy are about the right size. So I could go copy as bitmap, or I can go save as displayed. So saving as displayed, I'll put this on the desktop, and this is the uh, uh, K309 spectrum. And I get a uh, spectrum here. I can double click on that, and you can see that it's, it's actually a very, very high fidelity. Um, representation of it. You can zoom in a lot and get uh, uh, see that uh, it's a very, very uh, good quality sort of thing that you would actually want to put into a, a publication or a report. Uh, it's actually uh, transparent so that if you put it onto a page, th uh, the background shows through underneath the labels here. So that's why in this particular case it looks like gray on black, but if you put this down on a white background you would see gray on white background, or if you put it down on a green background you'd say green, gray on green. So uh, that's good for sort of PowerPoint presentations because you can choose what your background is and have the uh, lettering overlaid on it. So it's a really nice presentation for uh, putting into reports. Um, so that's, that's one of the visualization tools that we have available to us. So I'm going to go back to uh, full screen. Um, in addition to that, um, on this front page, we have uh, available to us a lot of uh, spectrum information. So um, I can uh, open and select multiple spectra using the spectrum list. If I select one spectrum, the properties associated with that one spectrum display over here. And so there's a lot of information here. Uh, some of it was read out of the file, and some of it was uh, uh, set up uh, from this default detector. Um, we'll discuss a bit more about that because that's a fairly sophisticated topic, but it's an important one and one we need to get into about the default detector, but it's, it's not what we'll discuss right now. For the moment, it's a, uh, we'll get various pieces of information out of the spectrum, like the, the live time, or the, uh, 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 what the uh, probe current was, or what the beam energy was. And uh, so those pieces of information actually come from the spectrum. And then information about the detector and other things actually come from this information over here. So we got that information too. Um, so uh, in this particular case, there was no, this, is, this material is not this spectrum is not assigned a particular material, so we didn't necessarily know what it was. So we could go ahead and say that this, this uh, spectrum was assigned a specific material, and um, I'm going to use the material editor right here. The material editor is a very uh, fairly sophisticated tool in as much as it's, um, it's actually backed up by a database, and that database is a user-constructed database. So it, uh, when you first install a program, it doesn't know very much. But as you enter in materials, it learns. And so um, this material, uh, K309, is something I work with regularly. So I've entered the composition for it in here. Uh, on the other hand, I could also uh, enter these, uh, mass fr these amounts in manually uh, using this editor here. So uh, 
I could go ahead and I'm just going to enter two of them. So it's about, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, I'm going to call it unknown because that won't. Okay, and um, so oxygen is about 39%. Uh, aluminum is about 7%. And you can see that each time that I add a new element, it uh, tells me how much I have still unassigned. So it's still 54% of materials that I haven't yet uh, assigned here. So we can do it either in mass fractions, or sometimes it's more convenient to do it in uh, atomic proportions, in which case when you enter numbers in here, they will be interpreted not as mass fraction, but as atom proportion. So. Um, Anyway, um, I'm going to go and use the database here to, to uh, uh, enter that in. So when I click this button here, it goes and searches the database and gives us um, that recorded values. Now that I've entered it in here, uh, you'll see that this information is shown down here. This composition of this material is this. And I differentiate, there's two different sorts of compositions that are, are important. There's the composition uh, which we enter in saying this is what we know it to be, and then there's also the composition which I call the measured composition, which is after you've gone and quantified it, um, what was the measured, the spectrum, the, the composition that came from the spectrum um, as a result of measuring the spectrum. And uh, those are two different things. They, you'd hope that they were very similar. Uh, but they are uh, conceptually two different things. And this label up here will tell you which one's currently being displayed. When it says composition, essentially that's the standard composition. It's this property right here, which is now being associated with this spectrum. Okay, so what happens when you select two spectra? Well, uh, two spectra, uh, it takes those properties that are in common between these two spectra and displays them over here. So both of these spectra are collected at 15 kV. And it hides any information that they don't hold in common. So they were both collected on the same detector and the properties of those detectors are the same. So all that detector-related information is different. But things like live time and probe current are not displayed because they are different for those two spectra. So. Okay, so we have that region in here which shows us properties of the spectrum. We can manipulate the spectrum list. We can reorder it, so if I wanted to put that up top. And that has the practical effect of changing the coloring up here. Um, we reverse that. Now, the, uh, previously the calcium fluoride was blue. Now it's red, just because we reordered here. I can group, if I have, say, 50 spectra in here, and I want to group a group of them together, I select maybe five of them, and then I hit the grouping. Or I can delete. There's also a uh, context-sensitive menu that says right-click for context menu, and doing that, you get various different menu items here. And we'll discuss these in uh, different uh, presentations, different videos. But uh, things like being able to rename the spectrum, sort the spectra by various things like acquisition time, by the name, by the detector, uh, are just useful things if you have lots of spectra you want to manipulate and report. Really, there's uh, no practical limit. There's a practical, well, there's a practical limit to how many spectra you can hear, and hear, but in theory, there's no limit to the number that you can do. I've had thousands of spectra in this list. It becomes a little cumbersome to work with, but it's, uh, there's no uh, fundamental limit there as to how many, except memory of your computer. So, okay, so another tab we have here is the report tab. And the report tab tells you sort of what's going on. So it's a summary of your day's progress. And uh, this report is, in fact, an HTML file. And it's, it's written out every uh, day to a, uh, a directory. The, this directory that I'm using is, is this listed here. So in 20, it's under DTSA2 reports, 2018, September, September 18th. And so I can go to that particular directory or any dates directory and see what report was generated on what given day. Uh, because these are HTML files, I can open them in a, a common web browser. 
And um, uh, so I can go back and review uh, my past work. I can um, select this and cut and paste it into reports and uh, things like that. Um, also, because it's HTML, you can search it. The, uh, the operating system for uh, Windows and Mac and Linux all have search tools that search uh, HTML very well. So if I know the name of a particular sample, um, I can uh, search using the search tools to find uh, reports that may be relevant to that particular sample. So the HTML, HTML reports are really a convenient way to uh, remember what you did in the past. So there's that. We'll see more of these HTML reports. Um, but there's also a, a command line. And the command line is, uh, is a very is advanced, but it's a, a tool for allowing you to uh, um, perform uh, various high-level tasks, uh, some, uh, some more routine tasks, too that are just uh, uh, useful for exporting data or for performing repetitive tasks or things, things like that. So that's what, that's what the overall user interface looks like. But there are also a series of, of menus that uh, have uh, things, f file tools, uh, processing tools. So these are for performing various processing functions on the spectrum, subsampling, fitting backgrounds, stripping backgrounds, linearizing energy axis, smoothing, trimming, and, and peak search. Um, that's under process. Under tools, there are various different tools that we'll go and discuss. Uh, there's a tool for quantifying spectra. There's a tool for simulating spectra. Um, there's a tool for uh, uh, calibration. So this is actually for uh, calibrating the detectors that uh, uh, form the underlying um, mechanisms for doing the modeling. Uh, there's a tool for optimizing measurements. There's also a tool for um, uh, tracking uh, quality control. So this is, uh, you would uh, uh, track the performance of your detector. So this is a very good system if you have some sort of ISO or other quality control system. This will allow you to process spectra, extract information from those spectra, and, uh, and uh, implement a, a very uh, high quality quality control system. There's some other tools for editing spectrum properties, assigning materials, making standard, standard bundles. And then there's also a thing called a standards database, which works with the optimization tool. Finally, there's reports. Uh, report uh, tools here. There's a report note that allows you to go ahead, we'll go ahead and do this. Report. Go down to the bottom, and we'll add a report note. This is some interesting data. Okay, puts that note in there. So if you wanted to make a comment or something, and there's some basic uh, uh, formatting you can do too in that. So put bold and italics and things like that. Uh, you can uh, uh, add the spectrum display to the report. So there, it's copied this spectrum up here into here. And this is useful, too, uh, for the same reason that uh, being able to export the spectrum, save it here, is useful. Um, and finally, you can open the report in the browser. We've already seen how to do that. You can either right-click over here to open the browser, or you can use that to open the browser. And the final menu item is, is just a series of uh, oh, of, of help functions. So there's uh, one help that'll take you to the DTSA2 website where there's lots of documentation. There's one help that'll take you to the, uh, this is Javadoc, the whole, uh, this is uh, uh, programmer's documentation for how the, uh, the underlying uh, algorithms work. There's a, a site that uh, uh, provides information on Jython, which is the language that's used in this command line. Uh, Python tutorial. Jython is a, a uh, Python-based language. There's a uh, 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 also uh, about DTSA2, which tells you some information about that. So there's lots of uh, lots of various different options here, and 
about uh, a, lot of, a lot of tools that we will discuss in uh, subsequent videos.